Hey, everybody. Welcome on back to the Twisted History Podcast. Little fact as Jeff is eating a fruit roll-up. Okay, all right. You announced it. Uh, fruit roll-ups, when they market them, they're actually called fruit leather. That's that's what they're called. Like you know, like some people I call beef jerky Slim Jims. That's not a good example. But let's say you call all paper towels bounties. Mm-hmm. I call all fruit leather fruit roll-ups because the idea of fruit leather doesn't entice brand? me. I've yeah. never seen a different brand. Yeah, I, I, th- I believe it's called fruit leather. They're Somebody awesome. correct me. This, this, I mean, you get everything on this podcast. Uh, so this Twisted History podcast, Twisted History, it's myself. It's John Kelly, John Kelly in the house. It's uh, it's St. Anne, St. Anne in the house. And it's Vibsy, myself and, and Mr. Jeff Vibber. Hello. One of my favorite people in the world. <laughs> Hello, I'm Vibs. Um, <laughs> last week I started uh, the podcast, I believe maybe it was two weeks ago. I started the podcast with a random uh, Martin Luther King fact. Uh, his mom was assassinated. And everybody kind of dug that. Uh, I think when we did another episode and I mentioned about James Earl Ray being on the lam and directing porn and being caught in England, people love that. And I think sometimes the conversations on Martin Luther King's assassination and even his life stop uh, from when the bullet entered his cheek at the Lorraine Hotel. Uh, so here's another Martin Luther King fact you may or may not know. I won't start every pod with these because this is the last one I have. Uh, Hiroshima. We speak about Hiroshima and Nagasaki a lot. Uh, Hiroshima is the only city outside of North America that – North America? Where the fuck did that come from? Out of North America uh, to honor Martin Luther King Day. I thought that was a weird fact that Hiroshima or Hiroshima, depending on what you like to pronounce things as. And the reason being is because King was an outspoken anti-nuclear activist. So for decades, Martin Luther King spoke adamantly against nuclear weapons that devastated Hiroshima and Nagasaki, saying that further use of such bombs would transform the, would transform the world, and I like this quote, into, quote, an inferno that even the mind of Dante could not imagine. It's a, it's a pretty powerful quote. In a 1967 letter addressed to the people of Japan, Martin Luther King wrote, Japan knows the horror of war and has suffered as no other nation under the cloud of nuclear disaster. Certainly Japan can stand strong for a world of peace. He also wrote of his desire uh, to visit, expressing hope that, quote, my schedule will soon permit me to bring a word of greeting to you from the people of goodwill and brotherhood in the United States. Tragically, King never made it to Japan. Four months after he signed the letter, he was murdered. But that doesn't change the fact that the Japanese people of Hiroshima honor his memory once a year. Um, it picked up some steam because the mayor of Hiroshima is a big MLK fan. So that's another little MLK arrow for your quiver. That's not a bad one to start with, right, Fibsy? That's very interesting. Yeah. How you doing, buddy? Sometimes uh, I'm doing very well. Sometimes I forget that, that people uh, not in the United States don't celebrate the same holidays yeah. as us. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Like, uh, I was watching the JFK assassination thing. This is kind of a left turn. Mm-hmm. But, like, uh, when he passed away, there were countries that were like mourning him and uh, had Catholic mass and stuff. Egypt had like Catholic mass. Right. Uh, interesting. I don't know. I, I yeah, like I found that after nine eleven to see people who put up um, like uh, memorials. Yeah. There's a Native American memorial. I can't remember. Maybe it's in England or in Ireland. Maybe, and they have some big memorial to nine eleven. There was like a poor tribe that sent all the money they could to like the victims' funds. So you don't know. I just know that we were just talking about the Banshees of Inisherin and how it kind of reminds me mm-hmm. of how my family speaks, my family back in Ireland. Because uh, my dad was born on an island off the coast of Ireland. So from Horse Island, where my dad was born, you could see Cork. So if you watch this movie Banshees, it's very similar. When I was with my dad on the island that he was born, we could see the mainland. So I don't know. I really like I like the movie. I had some problems with it, but I love the movie. And uh, I, re- I forget, too, like every now and again, I'll be speaking to a relative and I'll be like, you know, happy Thanksgiving. I'm like, what the fuck? You know, like, give me that. Yeah. yeah. Fucking, you know, <laughs> like, they don't, they don't yeah. give a shit, you know, <laughs> you gum. That was my uh, favorite part of the movie. It's just the fuck. Yeah. The fucking shite. You, you, you gob shite. Um, yeah. Excellent movie. Uh, so. That's number one. I get MLK out of the way. Two, in our discussion of mascots, I expressed a tiny bit of guilt uh, in owning a giant cigar store Indian. I said I was keeping it because I love it, but we were talking about symbolism like the Jewish statue in Poland. We were talking about um, lawn jockeys, particularly the lawn jockeys, not like the ones at the 21 Club, 
rest in power, but like the lawn jockeys that are, you know, very um, rude. We talk about how some of those things don't make it. We spoke about cigar store Indians, and I was like, screw it, I'm going to do it. Some guy had sent in a letter, his name is Oren, and he said, uh, large, you're allowed to own Native American art or sculptures as long as it's indigenous made. I think that's a good point. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like if I'm supporting, I'm not appropriating the culture, maybe I'm supporting the culture. So I checked, and sure enough, ours is. Whew. Absolutely. Well, yeah. So you're good. Yeah. Yeah. I think like if it was made in China, or if you could see the seams where it was just push, push, like pressed in some sort of fucking factory. Mm -hmm. You know, it's like the, the wooden bear I have on the back of my uh, porch. Uh, not that I'm appropriating bear culture. Uh, like the, the guy the carved gays it. are upset. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I'm a polar bear, so I, I get to use it. Um, the guy was carving it with a chainsaw in front of us, and so I bought it on the spot. We had a big truck at the time. We just popped this seven foot thing in the truck, and it's and it's one of our favorite little pieces. But um, so thank you, Oren. So I am fucking. I'm I'm all in. I'm all in still on uh, on my cigar store Indian. I was gonna say they're just so heavy that, oh. that you don't have to get rid of it because they're so heavy. It's such I a, a tore. Pain I tore my car apart. We had a we had a station wagon, D designer station wagon, John. Don't get me wrong. He does very well. And uh, I bought the cigar store Indian for a fifth anniversary because I think five years is wood, and uh, I gave her a little wood that night. And I gave her the cigar store Indian hey. that morning, and uh, it ripped. It is. It's very very. And we had to just keep rubbing it down in white vinegar because <laughs> it had just decades of cigars soaked into it. I bought it from the cigar <laughs> store. Yeah. yeah. Uh, oh, you're not a Seinfeld guy, but there's a <laughs> Seinfeld episode. Is it? Yeah, it's a whole cigar store. Is that the one where the Jewish guys were in the diner complaining? Oh, that's every Seinfeld. <laughs> I just couldn't fucking get into that show, and I love Larry David. Yeah. Honestly, kiss him on the mouth. I just like to remind people every once in a while that you don't, you don't like that show, and then mm -hmm. they just flood your DMs. Yeah, I need more. I need more blowback. Um, three. I got a letter from a guy named uh, Bo Bo Sullivan. Great name. Hey, Large, you love the show. I thought I might suggest something if you ever do that show on Henry Ford. You should mention Fordlandia when Ford bought some uh, land down in Brazil for a latex uh, plantation. Um, I know about Fordlandia, and I'm going to save it for the Henry Ford episode. But I just want you guys to remember, Henry Ford was a huge anti-Semite. Uh, Vibs had pointed out that... Um, Hitler had a life-size poster of Henry Ford on his wall. I wish that was. I wish we made that up. <laughs> he has a life-size picture of Henry Ford on one of his walls. He's the only American who's mentioned kindly in Mein Kampf. It's, it's it blows my mind. So we're gonna we're gonna do something on Ford. And then I said how he was trying to replace jazz, which was an infectious music of the Jews in his mind. It has nothing to do with Jewish culture. He was trying to replace it with square dancing. That was what we had mentioned uh, maybe last episode. But he also has so many other things, including this Ford Landy. And I'll tell you real quick, um, Henry Ford bought a huge swath of land in Brazil in 1928. Bought this huge swath of land. And he tried to do two things on it. He tried to grow and harvest sap from rubber trees to combat England's control over the rubber market because England owned all the rubber plantations in Sri Lanka so they were hiking up the uh, the prices because Henry's demand for rubber was increasing because of car tires so he said I'll go down to Brazil we'll plant rubber trees everywhere knew nothing about planting rubber trees uh, I'll get to that in a second but he also wanted to do it to create this utopian society and again I'll go deep dive into this but like he was he these he hired all these Brazilian people he was feeding them like hamburgers and canned vegetables like, it was an absolute culture shock. I don't think he allowed, like, music or television. So they were taking rowboats out to fucking whorehouses on islands. The whole thing was a mess. They planted the rubber trees too close together. It was an absolute failure. But it's uh, it's still alive today. There's this derelict town that was at one time uh, Fordlandia. So we'll get into that. And it's it's, it's a fascinating story along with uh, Very excited the rest of the Yeah, Very that'd be good. The Ford episode. And then our favorite, one of our favorite guys, uh, Buzz Aldrin. I'm going to mention this. Buzz Aldrin. Stud. Yeah, landed on the moon. Uh, somebody told him that they didn't believe he landed on the moon. Punched the guy in the fucking face. Uh, happy birthday, Buzz Aldrin. Just turned 93. And I think on his 93, uh, 93rd birthday, he married f a smoke show. Yeah. He yeah. married a girl who's much younger than him. Very pretty woman, considering that. She's a doctor. Yeah. Yeah. So it was, uh, it was perfect. What's that? She's 30 yeah, years she's younger. Like, she's like 65, 64. Yeah. 
Imagine if I got that from Annie. She went three. I said three o. Three o down. <laughs> like I was like, what the fuck are you talking about? Thirty years younger. Wow. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And she's a doctor too, huh? Yeah. I didn't yeah. know that. I'm not. Yeah. I'm not sure in what. I mean, he kind of needs one, I would think, right? <laughs> yeah, I guess. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but I, I think she might have been like a pediatric doctor, exact Still opposite helps. end of the pediatric, spectrum. Pediatric, geriatric. Yeah. yeah, yeah. You'll see soon enough. You'll see soon enough, sweetheart. Can't wait. Yeah, it's gonna be a long walk. So this week was supposed to be about pilots, and I was excited about it because Annie and I went to go see a movie called Plane with Gerard Butler. Gerard Butler, Plane, excellent, excellent movie. I tell you what, he's back. Gerard Butler is not going softly into the night like Liam Neeson. We saw a Liam Neeson movie called Memory, which was just depressing. Gerard Butler still has his fastball. Plane is excellent. It's all about a plane. And we were set to do pilots. I'm putting it off until next week, unfortunately. You know how you know he likes the movie? Uh, because he forgot himself and he's like, Gerard. <laughs> yeah, Gerard. Yeah, Gerard Butler. And uh, Brooklyn show. <laughs> I made a great Gerard. sandwich. Tomorrow. And we, we had great sandwiches, the whole deal. So I, I highly recommend it. But this week, we had so much feedback from scummy coaches. What do we want to call in that uh, episode, John? Twisted History of Horrible Coaches? Dirt, it's Dirty Coaches. Dirty? Yeah. yeah. Well, either way, we're trying to do like dirty. Apple was Scumbag. You want was it Scumbag? Yeah. 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 So yeah. Um, I don't mind it. <laughs> yeah. No, that's what I. Yeah. The yeah, graphics yeah. said dirty. One of the graphics said dirty. Yeah. But Scumbag is much, I think, better. Oh, you're right. I think, yeah. I called yeah, it yeah. on the YouTube one. It was dirty. Because yeah. I, I think, yeah. I don't know, Scumbag might trigger the into it getting in trouble, you know? Yeah. 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 Might you do for you. There's so much shit you can't say. Ugh, These pussies horrible. out here. This um, liberal media. Yeah. <laughs> you know what was been running on a social for us, too, is that clip where I spoke to you about us doing Daytona together. So I'm glad yeah. about that. I'll remind people just about every week until we go that Jeff and I will be down in Daytona together with a host of other people. He's doing a lowering the bar down there. Patty and Joey are going to be doing something for uh, Out and About. Uh, Spider and I will obviously be representing Rubbing His Racing. Uh, Alex from the Means Girls podcast will be down there um, and a couple other people. So Daytona is coming up rapidly uh and the launch of rubbing his racing is coming along with that jeff actually we have some drivers in tomorrow I think yeah you got ryan yep. blaney yep yeah so you have danny suarez and ryan blaney if you want any info on them i'll give you a bunch before absolutely yeah, yeah. i would love that and then i got jeff gordon and uh some guy named chase elliott i was i was oh sorry sorry to step on that <laughs> no i was gonna ask do you have a favorite driver or are you just kind of yeah you're so, just there for the the event no no i i'm i'm i, I love unbiased i love martin truex jr He's an older driver. Yeah. He's from Jersey. Um, they say now he might announce his retirement this year. Kevin Harvick, who's one of the older drivers, also announced that this is going to be his last uh, season driving. When I say older drivers, these guys are in their 40s. Um, Jimmy Johnson coming back you know, is kind of a cool storyline. But I love Chase Briscoe. I, I, he's, he's a friend of the... Uh, of the show very very good to us we're in a casino with him in kansas just a nice nice dude and i like him as a driver um so yeah i'm, I'm starting to get like too many favorites because mm -hmm. as i meet these guys they're all like decent dudes eric jones was a great guy no gregson was a great guy you know so um anyway uh, nascar is, is very very hot and his hot guys covered it now me and uh jeff some guy had mentioned the other day that jeff's uh sexuality is off the charts I'm a sexual being. I can't, I can't remember. Vibes is putting out a vibe. Uh, yeah. yeah. I, I throw them I, out there. I get it. Yeah. No, they never say it about me. They would probably say it about because John. They know we say how John's very handsome. People have never seen John. John's very handsome. We try to keep him off the camera. Yeah, yeah. There was a big uh, shoot us all uh, airplane disaster a couple weeks ago. Oh, I thought about man. You. Wait, yeah. There it was? Oh, yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah. I almost texted to you, and I was like, surely had, John's heard about this. I had my head buried in a. Uh, what, what is this one? Uh, it was. It, I think it was two planes on the ground where. Yeah. The worst accidents oh, happened. Oh, I did see that. I did see it. And it was they, in like Southeast Asia. Oh, I think you're talking about the runway one I saw. Damn. So, John, you have a plane crash now that you need to look up. You can go see Gerard Butler in yeah. plane. Yeah. And then in a couple of weeks, we have the Twisted yeah. History of Pilots. Yeah. It's a big time for you. <laughs> big yes. time for you. Perfect for Valentine's yeah. Day, just yeah. for John. Wait, <laughs> thoughts and prayers. I think three uh, mass shootings in one week in California. In California yeah. Holy shit. I saw another one this morning. Um, but we're going to go on to uh, more scummy coaches. People mail this shit in. Like I said, oh, my God. Like Mascots are still coming into me. I love all the mascots. I do. But people are like, you forgot about this guy. You forgot about this guy. Again, I'm not going to do like the smaller sex scandals. I'm not going to do people who just paid for people. Uh, Pete Carroll's not on this. Um, but anything bigger, I thought we kind of covered most of it. Yeah. We didn't. 
Somebody had sent in, um, not the coach, but the doctor from U.S. Women's Gymnastics. Oh, Larry we, Nasser. Nasser. Yeah. But we what covered them in gymnastics. Yeah. Yeah. We did the Twisted History of Gymnastics, and I went deep dive into uh, into that fucking asshole. Um, but yeah, so, and again, Penn State people, uh, I'm going to give them some sh- some shine here because people have come at me for that, uh, saying that I think Joe Paterno knew. I, apparently, some people don't believe that. So we'll talk about that a little bit in a little while. But I'm going to start out with somebody who's actually in-house. I've never met the gentleman, or at least I don't think I have, but there's a guy who works for Barstool. Maybe he's a contract guy or not. His name is Joe Pop, which, you know, Joe Pa, Joe Pop. But he's Jeff Nadu's producer. Uh, Nadu does a podcast that I was on called The Sit Down, The Sit Down Crime Podcast. It's all about uh, the mob. That's Nadu's uh, first love. Uh, so his producer, a guy named Joe Pop. Have you met this guy? No, sorry. I thought you were saying his producer was a coach. I, I... No, no. So his, Jeff Nadu's <laughs> producer had listened to gotcha. Twisted History of Dirty Coach, Scummy at Coaches, and he said we had left this guy out. I'm, um, yes. So I'm I, yeah. all on board now. I'm yeah. following. I'm here. Yeah. I'm awake. <laughs> so we're uh, – we're need another fruit roll-up. We're Nadu fans. I've done his show. Um, we were talking about one of these uh, cannibals. So he had me on a show. I think he wanted to have me on again for like a Madoff show or something too. But anyway, um, Mr. Steal Your Girls producer Joe Pop uh, sent this. It's out of Coppin State. You know Coppin State? I've heard of it. So have I. Like I've, I've been, uh, Maryland? I, Jesus, John. I've played them in an NBA the 2K you know game. That? College. It's NCAA uh, basketball. Like right no, but I, I know. Yeah. But how'd you know it was in Maryland? Coppin State. You learn I've, the regions. You learn where they're coming from. <sighs> Attaboy. Attaboy. This yeah, guy loves March. He's looking forward yeah. to it. All right. Go eat. Did you know that they're an HBCU? That uh, they I did to... not actually know. I didn't know that either. Yeah. Like I, when I think of Coppin State, I think of something out in the Midwest, and I don't think of it as an HBCU from Baltimore. And that's what it is. So Coppin State, in terms of demographic, uh, the population is seventy six percent female. I, I was just reading that. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And uh, likes that. Eighty three percent black or African American. So Vibsy's, you know, <laughs> taste for that. beautiful black women could be sated by doing a night class at Coppin State, perhaps. I'm all there. <laughs> yeah. Uh, the reason that they have some name recognition outside of John, just happened to remember him from the tournament, more specifically, 1997. They uh, beat South Carolina in the tournament, in the opening round. And that was the. it was just the third number 15 to defeat a number two in the history of the tournament. Like, that's where I remember them from. And then in 2007, 2008, Coppin State became the first team in NCAA college basketball history to reach the NCAA tournament with 20 losses. A little bit of a dubious achievement. But anyway, that's why they become synonymous. I guess I don't pay attention to the geographics of the brackets, so I never put them, like, in the East. Well, I think if you watch the games, uh, sometimes the announcers get obsessed over it. The yeah, that's true, too. school from Maryland. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Like, right, Six right, right. miles yeah. from their yeah. campus is yeah. the president's home. Yeah. They'll be eating crab cakes tonight Yeah, with some Baltimore bunnies. By the way, if you ever stay in Baltimore, anywhere near the wharf or the, the water, the, uh, the rats are gigantic. They're huge. And I was with uh, Tiro. Tiro was the account. That was down in Baltimore, and we were driving back from a dinner, and we were bombed. Me, I think Billy Hayes, a bunch of guys from T Row, and uh, all of a sudden, this rat came out, and I'm, it, it, it was the size of a fucking raccoon, and it terrorized me. And the guy was like, "Nope, Baltimore bunny," because especially around the water, and I was like, "Woof." You think they they eat the crabs? I don't know. I mean, they, they, they must eat well, you know, from a lot of the crab houses, but I don't know if they're. Uh, uh, fingers are allow them to actually you, crack the shells. You said Billy Hayes, and I thought you were talking about Woody Hayes. Oh no, no, a buddy of mine, Billy Hayes. Uh, I got, he's, I got uh, Woody Hayes trader. on the brain. Woody Excellent ha- sales trader. I wore my I wore my IU shirt in case you brought up Bob Knight on this podcast. I will. I'm okay. going to bring right. him up briefly. Okay, I mean, I will. I'll wait. I'll wait yeah. then. But here's the story about the scumbag coach from Coppin. Took me a while to get here, but here we are, boys. A story dropped last year detailing the events that took place in the fall of 2021. So this is a fresh wound. A former Coppin State basketball player is suing an assistant basketball coach for manipulating him into sending nudes and sexually suggestive texts and then blackmailing him into taping a sexual encounter before leaking all the content 
when he refused to engage further. It's a lot to to bring in. So this kid's a player at Coppin State. A assistant coach catfished him, blackmailed him into sending him, her, some stuff. And then this catfish had then forced him to have sex with one of the assistant coaches. And the assistant coach was the catfisher. It's fucking crazy. Fucked. Yeah. Joe Pop sent me the Yahoo link, but it looks like most of the info was ripped from Baltimore Brew. And John had said, show, show your work. So I'm citing a reference here. And that's Baltimore Brew. So that's what I'm going to do as far as most of the sources come from that. And again, this was all reported November of last year, so it's probably an open investigation. If I don't say alleged enough, just know I'm going to tell you the story primarily from the student's perspective. But this is still an open investigation. Lucian Brownlee is the name of the player. He was a former guard who also... Uh, no, I'm sorry. Lucian Brownlee is the bad guy here. Lucian Brownlee was a player, right, who served as director of player development and director of basketball operations. He's the assistant coach. His name is Lucian Brownlee. I apologize. Iben Williams, I-B-N. I say Iben. No fucking clue. Um, He was the player, okay? So Williams believed that he was speaking with a woman who had a romantic interest in him, convincing him to send photos and racy texts to keep her attention, not knowing that it's Lucian. It started off as a Manti Teo-ish online romantic connection, but eventually became toxic as the catfisher. Again, assistant basketball coach Lucian Brownlee threatened to release the material if Ivan Williams didn't send more salacious shit. You know, photos of him jerking off, all that kind of stuff. Out of fear of losing his scholarship, Williams continued to oblige the request. So the lawsuit, uh, the lawsuit states, and I quote, In fear of losing his place in the basketball program, his tuition, and room and board payments, Ivan continued to respond to the person, messaging him in a futile attempt to appease his tormentor. Okay? I went as, it went as far as Williams engaging in a sex act with Brownlee. Williams learned from Coach Brownlee, then a, then a senior who would then return next year as a staff member, that Brownlee had also exchanged sexual content with the online tormentor. So this guy Brownlee, who was catfishing the guy, went up to him and been like, is that girl catfishing you? She's catfishing me too. And then his alter ego said, you two have sex or I'm going to blow this thing up. So he then has to have sex with the assistant coach. This guy was a senior and went out to become assistant coach. Fuck. This is crazy. So the blackmailer then ordered the two men to have sex with each other. Williams refused at first, but when he returned to campus in the fall, the blackmailer demanded that Williams record and send a video of him and Brownlee engaging in oral sex. Okay? And according to the lawsuit, Williams, the player, complied. So he went and, I don't know, let the guy blow him. And in a Joe Paterno-ish twist, Juan Dixon, which also should fucking ring a bell, who's Coppin's head basketball coach. Do you know this? Oh, no, I, I, I know Juan Dixon. He I beat IU in the two, 2000 National Championship. Yeah, it was just 2001. I hate Juan yeah, yeah, Dixon. Yeah. Did right. they win two? Or? Oh, you're going to hate one. yeah. I remember the squabbles against Duke. He was a great player. Oh, very good. That was a yeah, good team. So good. Uh, Baxter, who Lonnie? They had was that so, Lonnie uh, Baxter? Yeah. The I, Maryland team, that was, a good, that was a good team. Yeah. So Juan Dixon is now the head basketball coach at Coppin State, you know, in Maryland, as, I, as you know. Mm-hmm. And so he was also named in the complaint for his failure to take action as the story unfolded. That's why I say it's paternalish. Mm. Even forcing Williams to attend practice the day after the sex tape was leaked. After this catfisher released him being blown by the assistant coach. I don't know why I'm doing this with people on fucking YouTube. Yeah. I don't think you need this pantomiming, but I'm doing this. The catfisher wound up releasing all this shit on Instagram. It's since been taken down. Okay. So he forced him to go to practice. Yes. And Juan Dixon, as they were just saying, may ring a bell because he was a stud at the University of Maryland. He led the Terrapins to their first NCAA championship in 2002 and made it to the NBA where he played for a handful of teams. I think he played overseas afterwards. His ex-wife, who he's now re-engaged to, that always works out, 
is Robin Bragg. She's a cast member in the Bravo reality television show, The Real Housewives of the Potomac. Mm -hmm. I only mention that because Robin and her re-fiance, Coach Juan Dixon, are reportedly leaving The Real Housewives of Potomac after this lawsuit was filed. They were expected to return for season seven, but now they're not going to do it, right? So the coach... Not only directed Williams to come to practice the next day, but Dixon also allegedly admitted to the student, to Ivan Williams, that Lucian Brownlee, his assistant coach, was mentally ill or otherwise emotionally imbalanced and that his history was shown to the coach, the athletic director, Derek Carter, and the school. So Coppin State is also na named in the complaint for their failure to support Williams questioning him harshly and retaliating against the young athlete for bringing bad press to the school by withholding the student's financial aid and housing. So this kid who got catfished into blowing an assistant coach then gets dropped from his housing and his financial aid. Oh, yeah. Ivan managed to complete the semester by working remotely, then transferred to another school to complete his degree. Okay? And they, they said that they had cut him off because Ivan had broke their policy on sexual misconduct with this leaked tape on Instagram. All this is fresh in the courts, so treat it all as alleged, as I said, but it caused a small shitstorm. People complaining it did not get much coverage because it's an HBCU. That's what people are saying. Also, people are wondering if the conversation would be different if Ivan Williams was a female. Like, that's a lot of the discussion in and around this. I really don't care. Either way, someone will make a movie about this. This will, and I have the title. The Blackmail of a Black Male. Oh, that's, that's not bad, right? I, yeah, I okay. love it. <laughs> the Blackmail. No, it's, I, I, it, I was it'll fucking sell. impressed with that. It it's hot. Blackmail. Black male, right? Just Blackmail. But how do you spell it? <laughs> but well, What do you mean? Like Blackmail and in Black, M-A-L-E or M-A-I-L. Yeah, I think you spell it like the letter. Because then it still means right. like a black male. I think there's a way on the movie poster where you can have it yeah. <laughs> kind of be it's a black ambiguous. Letter. You're like, what is it? Yeah, yeah. Ooh. So what's the devil's <laughs> <laughs> what's the devil's advocate for this? Maybe Ivan Williams had a sexual relation with Lucian Brownlee, regretted it, and said that it was a catfishing situation. Do you know, like, maybe that's the other side. We won't know until this thing is all resolved. Mm -hmm. But right now, speaking only from... Ivan Williams' perspective, it looks like Coppin State is in trouble. So you guys happen to know Juan Dixon, University of Maryland. You happen to know Coppin State. Now I think everyone knows Coppin State. They might be in a little bit of trouble in the next coming months. What a twist. That yeah, was yeah. that one. I like it. it was, <laughs> not too bad. Not that I like when this stuff happens, but I enjoy a modern story. I got a bunch. Yeah. I good. do. Uh, and, and again, like I didn't know anything about that. Thank you, Joe Pop. Then some guy I don't know. His name is Hayden D'Amico. I don't think it's D'Amico. It's D'Amico. What's going on, Large? Name's Hayden from Columbus, Ohio. I just want to say I fucking love Twisted History, and I think it kicks ass. I was listening to past episodes and heard where you said you try to read most messages sent your way, and I also think that kicks ass. So here we are. That's nice of him. Just wanted to reach out and throw out two things. I'm surprised as a Notre Dame guy who hates Michigan, something we have in common, you didn't bring up Bo Schembechler as a scumbag because he played the part in a sexual assault cover-up with his team doctor against not only his own players, but also his own adopted son. And when his son came forward about being molested, Bo closed fist punched him in the face, allegedly. <laughs> I'm going to get to this. I'll get to all this now. And two, if it's not too late for fun high school mascots, I went to Marshall University down in West Virginia. Hayden, I'm very familiar with Marshall University. That's where I had the spaghetti. Right outside of fucking Marshall. I sat in a Chad Pennington what booth. What was her name? I, 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 Dottie or something like that. I think it was a D. He loved the waitress. She loved the D. I mean, he's <laughs> sorry. I got a I got a slew of pictures from you. Was yeah. there? Was, was she? Uh, oh, she was sick. Kitchen anymore, huh? Uh oh, blue hair. I wrote a huge blog on it. They had a place called uh, something Jim Steak and Spaghetti. That's the name of the place, and it was fantastic. The food was whatever the food was. I don't give a shit. It was a fucking fantastic place. Fantastic. And I thought the food is good. Have you? So please don't. Sir, have you ever been to the place? Uh, around like 77th i think that serves spaghetti in a bag mm -hmm. they put spaghetti in a sack and they <laughs> no i haven't you. been there that uh that makes sense though, nick, huh? nick and brandon walker one time said like hey let's go get lunch there and i i ended up passing on it passing on spaghetti in a bag i'm an idiot but i i, I want to go so bad what now. a regret huh yeah 
But this guy went to uh, so uh, Hayden went to Marshall, right? He's like, there's a nearby town school in between Huntington and Charleston. Both places I've been to, Huntington and Charleston, and it's called Polka. And their high school mascot is the dots, so they're the polka dots. Not the way polka dots is usually spelled, but I believe a strong chance they don't care. Love the pod, man. Thanks for all you do. And then I fucking chided him because I mentioned the polka dots already, right? Yeah, I, yeah, I, I, I remember that. Yeah, yeah. So, but I, I can't be too mad at him because I love the fact that he brought up Bo Schembechler. This ain't personal. Even though I went to Notre Dame when Bo was coaching, Bo was still coaching while I was still there. Either that or he was the AD. I got to Notre Dame in 89. Okay, I think Gary Moeller took over for him in 90 when Bo was the AD. And I think after Moeller, then it was Lloyd Carr. Uh, and Lloyd Carr was a good coach, but in his final season, he lost to App State. Were you right before Rick Mirror? No, I was there with Myra. Ah, oh, that's awesome. I used to sit with Myra's. Didn't he uh, run the option? Yeah, we ran the option a lot, but the golden boy, the <laughs> Goshen Motion from Goshen, Indiana, Rick Myra, I used to sit with his sister. She happened to sit next to us in the uh, student section. I still keep in touch with Rick. Rick has a wine label. Rick, I believe, is the wine label Play Like a Champion today. I think he does pretty well with it, but he also has mirror wines. Rick Myra and I like talk on, it's a thrill for me because he was, like, Rick, I think, was the guy who threw the two-point conversion in the snow against the Penn State game. I loved Rick Myra. I also lo- I love quarterbacks that, like, ran the option well enough where people were like, maybe he could do it in the NFL, and it's like, nah, you can't do it. Yeah. <laughs> but yeah. they still give you a shot because you did yeah. it well he didn't, he didn't pan out. But, oh, I yeah. mean, but it's yeah. impossible to have yeah, that Yeah, that's my but. favorite, you know, backup quarterbacks, which he, you know, he went very high in the draft. He wasn't drafted to be a backup. Back of quarterback is my favorite position. Like when I was twelve, I was con- I was sad that Eric Crouch wasn't allowed to play quarterback. I was like, "What the oh, Nebraska? Hell? You know? <laughs> yeah. like, uh, right, he's the Nebraska kid, wasn't yeah, he? Yeah, in the NFL, yeah. they were like, "No way!" I was like, "What do you mean, no way?" Yeah, Myra had a gun though. I shouldn't say that he was an option quarterback. Tony Rice ran the option uh, for the '88 national championship team. He was able to kind of take off. So Tony Rice was a more of an option quarterback than Rick. Um, but man, yeah, I have fond memories of him. But so, uh, Lou Holtz versus Bo Schembechler was a thing, uh, Notre Dame, Michigan. And he, when he says, I hate Michigan, he's right. It's my least favorite uh, school as far as, you know, sports goes. I don't hate anybody, but uh, Muck Fishigan or whatever. He had one of those T-shirts. Um, all right. So, and that, and I, I put this in. I had a really good bowl season this year. Notre Dame and Alabama won. I paid for my kid to go to Alabama. And uh, Michigan and USC lost, so that's good for me. But back to Bo. His name is Glenn Edward Bo Schembechler Jr. He actually played football for Woody Hayes um, at uh, at Miami, and he was an assistant at OSU under Woody in the early fifties. Right. So from 1963 to 1968, um, Bo Schembechler was the football coach at Miami University, not Miami Miami University, not the University of Miami. Miami University is the cradle of coaches. Uh, that's where Ben Roethlisberger went. Miami of Ohio. Yeah, Miami yeah. of Ohio, exactly. And it's also the uh, alma mater of our 23rd president, uh, Benjamin uh, Harrison. Go Red Hawks. Okay? Uh, so, and then Bo went to coach University of Michigan after he'd left Miami. And he coached there from 1969 to 1989, compiling a career record of 234, 65, and 8. So only Nick Saban, Joe Paterno, and Tom Osborne of Nebraska have recorded 200 victories and fewer games as a coach in major college football. That's rarefied air. Bo, Saban, Paterno, and Osborne. The only difference is those other three all won multiple national championships. Paterno won two. Osborne won three. Saban has seven, and he's going to get some more with my kid there. Bo never even won, no. Never, Never won one. Even though he began his tenure head coaching at Michigan with a rallying cry to his players, those who stay will be champions, which never happened, unless he meant uh, Big Ten conference titles because he won 13 of those. I love one story about Bo in particular, but I'm going to tell you two. In 1982, Texas A&M offered Shem Beckler $3 million for 10 years. That was the richest contract in all of college athletics, not just football at the time. But Bo turned it down, saying, frankly, I've come to the conclusion that there are things more important in this world than money. For that reason, I decided to stay at Michigan. And everybody in Ann Arbor fucking lost their minds. And I love that. I love that this guy had a bag thrown in front of him 
And he's like, nope, I'm a Michigan man through and through. Respect. Three million, ten years. Three million over ten years. Three nowadays, million, sounds yeah, I guess so. so thirty million dollar contract. You know, who gets thirty million dollar contract now? Everybody, you know. But that was the biggest contract in the history of collegiate sports when it was offered to him by Texas A&M. Which, by the way, it's not like they were asking him to go coach, you know, Joe's house of college. He was going to go to Texas A&M and College Station. But he's like, nah, I'm staying in Ann Arbor. I'm staying in the big house. Good on him. And then number two, I love this story. After his time at Michigan, he stepped down as AD in 1990. From 1990 to 1992, Shan Beckler was the president of the, Detroit, of the Detroit Tigers. Another Michigan man type position. The Detroit Tigers he was president of. And there, were, there he was an opponent of female reporters in the men's locker room. Annie? So he was against women being in the locker room. How do you feel about that? I guess it depends on what time. I mean, if it's right after the game when they're stripping down, That's maybe the they don't want them. Then no. Then the reason if they his, don't want them there. There's, there's, privacy is, is, is a thing. It's real. His big People pitcher and future Hall of Famer, Jack Morris, he had told the Detroit Free Press there was a reporter there. I think she was like an intern, too. She's a very young girl. This was in 1990 when Bo had first got there. And he said this to her while he was in like a pair of compression shorts. He's like, I don't talk to women when I'm naked unless they're on top of me or I'm on top of them. And he told her that in mixed company with a bunch of other reporters around and he got dragged for it. And again, like he plays stupid games, you get stupid prizes. If you're going to go in a locker room where a bunch of guys have their dicks out and testosterone is going, a guy like Jack Morris is probably going to say something like this. My only thing is, is that if you're in a locker room and the press is there and they're yeah. taking videos and they're taking pictures and it's for public consumption, then there's no reason she can't be there. But if they don't want their pictures public, you know, if they're just like if there's a bunch of naked guys behind me mm. and I'm a male reporter and I'm, t- I'm interviewing you and you're fully dressed. Yeah. Tyson said something similar. Tyson says, I'll only talk to women if I'm about to fornicate with them. He used the word fornicate, I believe. Mike Tyson. Speaking to them naked. No, no, I, I, I can't remember why he said it, Depends. but just the way he said fornicate was awesome. <laughs> I mean, you brought up. But Bo. <laughs> kind of like the way you said Gerard before. Yeah. I heard a good argument against this, though. It's like a lot of males grow up with female teachers. So it's like, why would, why would you ever feel that way? about like any female in a room? You know, like, oh, I can't talk to a female. Well, if you're naked, I just think if there's dicks like, out. What? If you're naked I just think if there's dicks the out. Room. Like, this is locker room. Yeah, like, but that's what I mean. Like, even when you're young, that could be possible. Your teacher right. could have maybe not be in your locker room, but right. certainly well, when we you're all young growing enough. up, it was always boys and girls locker room. It was never. Yeah. A but there's there is a premium on talking to somebody first, yeah. right? Like when Vibs came out from a cross country race, right? But then it you shouldn't be in a locker room. There should be it should be someplace else. I get it. If but men want their privacy, they should be entitled to it. But should it then be then men shouldn't be allowed in the locker rooms either? To give women an even feel to get that first right. response, right? It right? should be no, no one. You true. Shouldn't, you shouldn't. There have, should be a yeah. press room in between. Stop in the press room. You get you good want. shit in the locker room, like the popping the champagne bottles and the smoking of the cigars, mm-hmm. just the towel around it. You know. But that's the cost of it. That's. Yeah. I mean, to say that they aren't entitled to their privacy, I, I disagree. I think if a woman wants it, she gets it. If a man wants it, he gets it. But remember the name Jack Morris, because that's a quote. I don't talk to women when I'm naked unless they're on top of me or I'm on top of them. (laughs) Bo then added saying, no female member of my family would be inside a men's locker room regardless of their job description. And he suggested the whole thing was a scam orchestrated by you people to create a story. He was fired by the Tigers. He was fired by the Tigers in uh, August 1992 and he got fired by fax. Mm. That's not good. Jack Morris went on to be a color analyst for the Tigers, but got suspended in 2021 after Shohei Otani. Shohei Otani was coming up to bat uh, DH, and the Tigers announcer Matt Shepard had asked Jack Morris, "Now, what do you do with Otani?" And Jack Morris had said back to him, "Be very, very careful," like he did in a Chinese accent, and he was suspended the next day. So Jack Morris tends to put his foot in his mouth a little bit. Neither thing, I don't have a problem with it. You know that I try to do Asian accents all the time. And I'm ver- I didn't even did do it. a good one there. <laughs> yeah, no, but that's, that's more reporting and stuff like that. That's not, that's not the bad thing about Bo. I just remember that. Mm-hmm. I remember Jack Morris saying, I, if you're not on top of me, I'm not on top of you. Get the fuck out of here. I remember Bo having to defend it. I remember Bo not taking the money from Texas A&M. What I didn't know was 
about this thing. I'm going to re- try and read it, too, because I don't want to get this wrong. But beginning in 2018, hundreds of former students and student athletes who played at the University of Michigan came forward with allegations of inappropriate and unwanted medical treatment by university, university doctor Robert Anderson. Robert Anderson was the monster here. He was employed at the university from 1966 to 2003. He's dead. He what? died in 2008. He died 10 years before all these allegations came out. So, again, we can't get answers from dead guys. What, what's going on in Michigan? you got Michigan State That's with Larry Nasser, and you got Robert Anderson, a monster at yeah. Michigan. 100. What's going on in the Big Ten? Yeah. Do you know? Oh, <laughs> like, God. Because you, know, you got Penn State. State. Yeah. Uh, Indiana with that fucking statue. That, that pedophile. Yeah. Uh, Kinsey. Kinsey. Yeah. What's his first? Uh, Albert. Albert. Yeah. You know what? You. We don't care. Yeah. yeah. But anyway, these people Your put lawsuits. Forgotten. So they, they launched what they do all the time, like they did in Penn State with Free. They had an independent investigation. It was conducted by Wilmer Hale, LLP. Their 240-page report stated that over 600 former student athletes at the University of Michigan experienced these assaults. 600. And here is the damning part. One former football player claimed Schembechler told him to toughen up when he reported an incident of Anderson fondling his testicles during an examination. I mean, so 600. I'm going to try to get to like some of the some of the particulars of it because think fondling about that, though, testicles. For one second. I could fondle testicles, 600 testicles easily. But think about this for one second. Go ahead. Okay. The fact that this guy felt violated and he didn't turn around and punch him right in the <clears throat> face shows a tremendous amount of restraint. Mm. He actually, the fact that 600 people didn't, by the way. I know, but this guy felt okay. compelled to stand up and say something. Right. I mean, the fact, because well, it, it would have been frowned upon. He would have been yeah. like, oh, you punched him. He was just giving you a physical. But he actually kept his composure and said something. In June 2021, Schembechler's adopted son, Matt Schembechler, came forward and said that he was also molested. Bo married Mildred, his second wife. She had three sons that Bo had adopted as his own. And I think then together, Bo and Mildred might have had another one or two boys. So he had three uh, from Mildred's first married. That's why he was his adopted son. So one of these sons, Matt, said he was molested at age 10 by Anderson during a routine physical in the 60s. And that Shem Beckler went to great lengths to ensure that Anderson kept his job after Matt's mother told the athletic director, Don Canham, who was ready to fire Anderson before Coach Sam Beckler's intervention. For some reason, Bo had this guy stay. Upon telling his father what happened, Matt said, that was the first, a quote, that was the first time he closed fist punched me and it knocked me all the way across the kitchen. Here's the other side, because I like to give both sides. Shem Beckler's biological son, and Matt's younger half brother, Glenn Schembechler, I think his nickname is Shemmy, refused to believe Matt's version and stated, I can tell you unequivocal, unequivocally that no one ever told Bo about this doctor. In his opinion, Bo's son, Bo would have done something. But I read accounts of two former players who think the exact opposite of Glenn, who were in Matt's corner. And I think I'm going to pay attention to them more because Glenn never got diddled, right? So I'm going to talk to people or listen to people a little bit more than him saying, oh, my dad would never do that, never tell on this doctor. I think I'm going to listen more to people who got fucking fondled and molested by the doctor. So that's how I'm going, okay? Former Michigan football players Daniel Kwiatkowski and Gilvani Johnson both described their experience with the late Dr. Anderson, noting that he made efforts to arouse them. He digitally penetrated them, fingered their asses, and inappropriately touched them. I was se- Here's a quote. I was 17 years old and full of piss and vigor and wanting to become a Michigan man and Michigan football player. But Bo didn't keep me safe. He broke his promise to me and my family in the fall of 1977. This is Kwiatkowski. Bo knew. Everybody knew. It's hard to share this story, but I hope in doing so I can bring some peace to other survivors. Kwiatkowski was assaulted by Anderson during a 1977 physical, but upon reporting it to Bo Schembechler, he was advised to toughen up. Harbaugh, coach of Michigan now, 
has been quoted defending Schembechler, saying it wasn't the bow he knew. But I assume Harbaugh never had a finger up his ass, yeah. so I don't care. I don't care what he thinks about Bo Schembechler. I care what happened to these kids and the fact that he may have known and decided not to act on it. So I don't want any fucking character, you know, whatever. Um, either way, much like uh, Paterno, we'll never know the truth because Bo di he died on a toilet on November 17, 2006 at the age of 77. I don't know why I mentioned it, but he died in a bathroom stall. important to know. <laughs> Last tidbit, before he died, Bo had agreed to be an honorary pole bearer for former Michigan Wolverine and University of Michigan alumnus President Gerald Ford, but Ford wound up outliving Bo, dying just under a month later on December 26, 2006. So when I guess when Gerald Ford was on his last legs, Bo said that uh, when he gets buried, I'll be a pole bearer. And then Bo wound up dying, as I said. Uh, he had uh, like some rare disease around his heart, so he died on a toilet a couple of months before that. But that's the story. So this guy had mentioned it casually, and he's right. Bo's son says Bo punched him in the face when he complained about being diddled by a fucking team doctor. And that team doctor has allegations in the hundreds, including former players who said that Bo did nothing and knew about it. Harbaugh and other people who weren't assaulted or anything like that tend to stick up for Bo. You make your own decisions. But it's still fucking 100% wrong and despicable, and this guy should be buried under the prison if he wasn't fucking already dead. You agree? Uh, absolutely. And of course, his, his one son is going to try to defend his dad and of course. keep, yes, keep yeah. the legacy intact. Right. But yeah, if it happened to him, Why I don't would think they he'd say be saying the same thing. At yeah. the risk of losing believe. their spot on the roster. Defend your brother, but... I can't believe I'd rather defend doctors, my brother than my dad, but I don't know. Docs and coaches go after these athletic kids. I mean, maybe there's like some spark of homosexuality in between them that they then act on and they're 100% wrong. I, I don't know. I, I wonder if it's just accessibility. It's just like, oh, I can, oh, I think I can have control. unlimited access to these kids. And well, I'm, you've I'm been with power. trainers more than any of us. You've had your ankles taped and all that kind of stuff. Yeah. Like, you know, where there's been a certain degree of intimacy with a team doctor and trainers. I mean, have you in your lifetime ever had somebody spend too much time on your groin? No, no. no. I, it's Yeah, it's always like student athletes or people right. that you can obviously tell like love athletics and want to be there. Yeah. Which who knows? Maybe this doctor made it seem like he loved Michigan football. Right. and he. Oh, but but yeah. Yeah, every time you read a story or a statistic about a rapist... It's control. That's what mm. they're. That's no. what turns them on. Not the sex. It's the control. The power. Yeah. 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 I got control over you. Go ahead. This Let next me see you say something. Yeah. This yeah. next one is a little bit similar. So I, I. It's more to talk about in that term. That was. Comes that from, was rough. I did not. Because Bo is a fucking legend. I didn't know anything about really Woody Hayes or Bo Schembechler. Right. I knew Woody Hayes had, was kind of angry. Right. Kind of like a Bob Knight. Like I, well, they're the exact same person pretty mm -hmm. much. But yeah. It, wow. Yeah. Yeah. And Woody Hayes and Bo Schembechler, it's crazy too. Bo played for him, coached underneath him, and it was one of the most bitter rivalries ever. I think Bo was coaching that side where Woody Hayes went for two and said because he couldn't go for three. So there was a lot of hatred uh, between the two. Probably mutual respect, though. Um, yeah. Travis. Travis said something in. Again, I'm not using last names because I don't know if I'm allowed to. Oh, I, I'm not allowed to with this guy. I asked this guy, Large, I love the show. Wife and I listen every week. Thank you, Travis and Mrs. Travis. I know you mentioned Twisted History Scumbag Coaches and that you didn't want to get too far into the sexual assault stuff, but the list is so long. And I wanted to pass along one that I thought was more relevant due to it uh, being between a coach and his players. Yeah, that's, that's what I want to talk about. I don't want to talk about, and I am actually going to talk about Patino in a little while, but like, like a, you know, like people who are just banging Chris, Chris yeah. Beard who just hit his wife. Yeah. Just domestic abuse. 100 percent. Or, you know, Dana White, uh, yeah. former uh, head baseball coach of Concordia University, Chicago, which is D3, was fired in 2010 because it came out. He was telling guys. All right, listen. So this guy is the head baseball coach at Concordia University, Chicago. He was fired in 2010 because it came out he was telling guys in his team the only way he'd get them in front of pro sc scouts was if they jerk off on camera so he could sell it online. He would put a note on his office door saying, video for class being recorded, please do not disturb, when in reality it was so he could watch the guys crank off at his desk on his laptop. 
What the crazy fuck? part is I was recruited by this guy. My dad and I sat on the couch <laughs> ugh, in question <laughs> on my recruiting visit. Thanks for all that you do. That's from Travis. No last name, and I don't fucking blame you. Yeah. Fuck. I never heard of Concordia College. Uh, Concordia University of Chicago. There is a Concordia College very close to us. This is in Bronxville, New York. This has nothing to do with them. Go Clippers. If you go to Concordia College, breathe easy. It's got nothing to do with you. This is Concordia University, Chicago, right? I mean, we could we could hit Bronxville with a three iron from here. Um, let's dig in. Like that. Like go how ahead. do you? The, Jeff, this D, guy's bad. Yeah, you're at this a D three school. Like, you just gotta quit baseball. Just stop. But I could see a guy being in a D3 school with, like, a rocket arm who thinks uh, that he has a shot at the pros. Yeah. You know? Oh, God. But I'm not – Baseball's I was, different. I, I feel like the internet is such a big place you could put your thing out there. You don't – Yeah. Your uh, tape out there. You don't have to jerk off on a camera so this guy will put it in front of someone. That's exactly yeah, who knows? what they were doing. I don't know. It's exactly That's, what he was doing yeah, with them. Yeah. The guy's name is Spiro Lempesis. 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 He was fired in 2010 – for what it would describe two years later, Concordia University would describe two years later as egregious, suspected, inappropriate sexual conduct. In 2018, a lawsuit was filed on behalf of the then 28-year-old former pitcher Anthony Calaro in Cook County Circuit Court. Anthony Calaro and Spiro Lempesis. It alleged that Lempesis forced Calaro, as well as other teen victims, to wear a specific uniform during some of the sexual encounters, including a white sleeveless t-shirt, black pants, and or paraphernalia from the rock band Kiss. Fuck, I love Kiss. I've seen Kiss Doesn't live. Doesn't make them deviant. Ah, screw it. that guy. I mean, same thing with the guy, the, 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 what's his name? Put, all, the serial killer put on this Kiss ACDC. shirt and jerk off and I'll get you in front of a scout. That's all, what's happening. All deviants like Kiss, though. That's a fact. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so, Calaro's civil lawsuit goes a step further, alleging over 12 counts that Lempesis committed sexual battery and Concordia, right? They always go after the university, which they should because that's where the money is, was negligent, failing in its duty to protect Calaro and other student athletes from his predations. Before he was hired at the university, Lempesis worked as a teacher in a Chicago middle school where he allegedly sexually abused and raped several minors while the minors participated in after-school extracurriculars. At least one of the boys was just 13 years old. It amazes me that these guys get so far without being, having, you know, knifed in the throat. Yeah. Yeah. He was, he was fired. He, uh, he exposed... Minors to pornography and fondled them, drugged them, and arranged for others to rape them. He threatened the boy and his family with a knife or a gun in order to keep the abuse under wraps. This is what the lawsuit claims. So that's what I'm reading. So we'll treat it as alleged. After parents complained, he was not rehired for the 1996-97 school year, then went to Concordia. Self-control. Concordia, this yeah. is amazing self-control. I, they complained. How did no one 99, 1997 was, to, like, we're thinking now, 1996-1997, you didn't just Google somebody and everything came up either. Right. It was fucking crazy. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Remember? Because I was doing take a report. You got to think. Yeah. Sorry, you got to think uh, he's... Uh, no one knifes him in the throat because he's going after weak people. You know what I mean? He's yeah. going after the weakest. But you're saying parents or people, complained. Or, That's or, a lot of yeah. parents. You have to have a lot of parents to get them together, coordinated, come as a group to complain. Mm-hmm. I mean, right. the fact that not one dad rang his doorbell and, and castrated him is, I mean, that yeah. blows my mind. Yeah. Because I can tell you right now, someone that's to my kid, I think I would do it myself. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. No, I would take, yeah, I would take matters into my own hands. Yeah. Uh, after Lempesis was hired at Concordia, uh, I was gonna go say maybe maybe the, 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 did did they say that parents are complaining or yeah maybe it was like single parent households where they know that they don't have like the parent yeah. I don't know or he's just careless about it and just maybe there's crazy. not enough evidence. really nilly yeah maybe there's not enough evidence maybe you know the guy getting fired and then leaving town and then again you don't just get on the internet at that time and f- follow up on Coach Lempesis like yeah. if you're in. Chicago. Like if my kid came to me and told me that, and I heard there were other kids, and it was like a, you know, they were right. like, "This happened to your kid too." I don't know. Yeah. I so, the, the but Limpisas and Calaro. Limpisas was hired at Concordia. Concordia. He met Calaro in 2000 when Calaro was just 10 years old at a baseball summer camp. It was then Limpisas first sought to prey on the boy, according to the lawsuit. By the time he entered high school, Calaro was taking private pitching lessons from Spiro. He considered him a mentor. 
and the lessons sometimes lasted until 10 p.m. During these training sessions, Lempesis allegedly watched the boy undress, fondled with him, fondled him and showered with him, and then sexually assaulted him. Though the teen told his mother she dismissed the allegations, the lawsuit claims. And this is where Vibs' point comes in. In 2007, Calaro, who had an abusive family and financial troubles. Like, you don't know what these kids, like, it's not like Bridge or Mick coming to Finn coming to us because we're so normal. No, no, I'm talking about the parents who went and complained. But it got him a scholarship. All that fondling and shit got him a scholarship. I'm, I'm saying that. So he went to play baseball at Concordia for the coach. Calaro's complaint alleges them pieces coerced them into engaging in at least 30 sex acts in his office. By the way, on that same couch that Travis and his dad was on. Yeah. Ugh, sure. Right? Yeah. Uh, over the course of two years, and then he was told to make sex videos, Who pro- and the coach promised to get him in contact with major and minor league scouts to help him get drafted. At Concordia, the coach sexually abused multiple students and or players, including molestation of minors while employed. This is what the lawsuit claims. The abuse was often videotaped, using Concordia's equipment, too. Like they're trying to find connections there and on Concordia's property. Like all this is, you know. Mm-hmm. So Lampesis was fired in September 2010 after the school received reports about the inappropriate behavior. And nearly two years later, he was reportedly arrest, arrested after he was found in the backseat of a Honda Civic with a 16-year-old boy in the parking lot of a church at 2 a.m. He allegedly told the police he met the boy at baseball camp and they were discussing colleges. Because that's what you do. That's uh, the Coach, place can you talk time. to me about uh, control? Yeah, I'll see you at 2 a.m. in the church parking lot in the backseat of my fucking Honda Civic. Would you take your shirt off and get comfortable? That's control again. So anyway, right? that's that's another one that we missed. But that's Concordia College of uh, of Chicago and Coach Spiro Lempisis, 100 percent a scumbag coach. All right, I mentioned uh, during the first episode about Art Bryles. I was astounded on the amount of things that were going on in Baylor University and the football team. The rap sheet for that small little window was breathtaking. But I didn't mention the men's hoop coach. And people sent this to me. I don't know if you know about this guy, but his name is Dave Bliss. Multiple people send this to me. And I'll get to the skinny of it. Um, All right. As a reminder, Baylor head football coach Art Bryles was fired. And the school's president and athletic director resigned after all that stuff that I told you that happened between 2012 and 2016. That was football. Dave Bliss, the former men's basketball coach, is at the center of one of the biggest scandals in college sports history. Here's the skinny. In 2003, one of his players, Carlton Dotson, murdered another one of his players, shot him, Patrick Dennehy. So Dotson shoots Dennehy. Investigators found Dennehy's body and head separated and dumped in a gravel pit near Waco. There was a rumor that he cut his head off. Winds up, they think, wild animals had ripped his head. He was shot in the head. Wild animals going after the wound had ripped his head off. Either way, one of the players shot another player to death, okay? So now Bliss, who is illegally paying for the dead player's tuition through boosters or whatever, had tried to have other players start the rumor that the dead kid was a drug dealer. That way people would think he was able to pay for his tuition with drug money and the blame wouldn't come back on Bliss. That's fucking crazy. So to cover up his NCAA rules violations. These violations included Bliss making tuition payments for players and unreported failed drug tests. When his lies were uncovered, Bliss was effectively banished in 2005 from NC competition for 10 years for what the NCA called despicable behavior, unethical conduct, and a blatant and sweeping disregard of rules. There's a movie about this whole thing. It's a pretty good movie. 2017 Emmy Award winning Showtime documentary called Disgrace. And it's, you know, it doesn't have actors involved and stuff like that. It goes through the whole story about Dave Bliss. Bad guy, scumbag coach, and just throw another log on the fire of Baylor hiring fucking bad people. Um, Bob Knight. I said I wasn't going to talk about people who are physically abusive to their players. Bob Knight's a perfect example. Uh, The coach of Rutgers, Andy, we were talking about him yesterday, Mike Rice, who was canned in 2013 when ESPN aired Rutgers practice videos showing the coach verbally and physically abusing players. 
I don't think there's anything new in that. You ever hit by a coach? No. Did coach push you? John? No. Um, no, I mean, we used to get a little manhandled in football. Like, you know, they'd pick you up and throw you around. Grab you by the face mask? Yeah, you know, like pick you off the pile and put you in lines and stuff like that, but nothing nothing crazy. Like somebody told me that Holtz. Like, I remember, or like smack you on the helmet, but nothing crazy. I remember Lou Holtz like grabbed Pete Bursich. Um, Pete, Pete Bursich was huge. You know, Holtz is 115 pounds with a lisp. Kind of got in his face and was yelling at him, you know. What are you doing, Clan? And like I think Holt spits when he talks. You know what I mean? Like that's like something I don't know, but but Mike Rice was a little bit more physical than that and he got canned. And he then shot me this lady who I'd never heard of. And since I haven't shit on any women yet, I'm gonna throw her in there. She was Texas Tech's women's hoop coach. Her name is Marlene Stallings with an O. Not like Gene Stallings with an A. USA Today scooped this story. Um it was published in August 5th, 2020. Twelve players left Texas Tech since Stalling became head coach in 2018 over accusations that Stallings and her staff were verbally abusive and subjected players to dangerous forms of conditioning. This is what I think is crazy, Vibs. There is a requirement for players to have a 90% heart rate in practice and games. At all times. Your heart rate had to be over 90. That, mm. that seems high, right? When I had a stress test, they had to get me over like 90-something. I mean, yeah, not, you're going balls to the wall. Right. All out. If you're she, at 90. She used this as a torture mechanism, uh, mechanism. Players would be questioned if they did not reach the bet mar- benchmark, and possible consequences included further conditioning and potentially reduced playing time. They wore heart rate monitors during the game and during practices. And during workouts, two players said that they stopped taking over-the-counter pain medications because if we were in pain, our heart rates would automatically be going higher. Mm. That's not good. Like, that's that's not good at all. Um, Emma Merriweather, this poor girl, she wound up transferring to get away from stalling. She said that she was scolded for having panic attacks, a sign of depression for which she was later diagnosed. Girl was sick. Stalling's took away Merriweather's dog at some point and said that it was a distraction from basketball and, like, gave her dog away to boosters. This poor girl's having panic attacks. She's getting chided for it. Then she has her fucking dog taken away. A couple other things that happened to her. And Marlene wasn't the only monster. Five players claimed that the strength and conditioning coach, Ralph Petrella, sexually harassed them. Petrella was accused of making multiple suggestive comments and using a recovery therapy technique that involved applying pressure to the chest, pubic bones, and groins. Nice. Petrella also once made that Merriweather girl, panic attacked, no dogs, said get on the scale, and when she came in overweight, he announced her weight to the men's team. Like, this poor girl can't get a fucking break, right? Petrella denied the allegations but he also voluntarily resigned after the 2020 season. Stollings was fired from her position in 2020 with four years remaining on her contract, but she sued, saying that internal reviews at the school had cleared her of allegations raised in the U.S. Today report. Like she said, all the stuff from USA Today, the school knew about, and they cleared her on it. So firing her was unjust. And then in August of just last year, she won. And Texas Tech paid her $740,000 in settling the lawsuit. Now, Texas Tech, like I was getting on Baylor. How about fucking Texas schools? Texas Tech is the same place where uh, Mike Leach was. Mm -hmm. Mike Leach, rest in peace, unfortunately. But he was suspended in late 2009 after he forced a player, I think Craig James's son, right? Craig James's son, I believe it was, to sit in a dark closet for three hours after he suffered a concussion. And Leach was fired just before the Alamo Bowl in January 2010, but went on to coach a couple of stops, um, including Mississippi State. That was his last stop before he died in December at the age of uh, only 61. He was in Wazoo, yeah, Michigan State. I just remember that being on SportsCenter whenever it happened, and it was a big Put him in the fucking dark closet, yeah. Yeah. I got a concussion, get in the closet for three hours, both in Texas Tech. Um, Back to women. I was just talking, I was doing uh, Barstool Finance with uh, Brendan Clancy and Tyler Morin, right? And we were talking about this topic, and they had mentioned Rick Pitino. And, like, 
this is what I remember about the Rick Pitino story. It was so goddamn embarrassing for him. I almost felt bad. He was a married father of five. He's the head men's coach at Louisville. And in 2003, he fucked an ex-car show model. And she was the wife of the equipment manager at the time. Um, I thought it was in the bathroom of an empty Italian restaurant, but I wanted to be banged her at a table. And there's nothing illegal there. It's immoral, right? But then she started to extort him for money. First to pay for the abortion, and then to pay for her other kids' tuitions, and then to pay for her mortgage. I think she tried to get like $10 million out of Patino. So Patino had turned her in. And then as she started to send more and more stuff, she went to court and she was found guilty. But in the trial, this little tidbit came out. Now, again, Patino's a father of five. Caught dead to rights, sleeping around on his wife, and, you know, and his poor kids are there to see it. But in the report, uh, or excuse me, in the trial, she testified that the sex only lasted 15 seconds. Oh, that's, that's unfortunate. I, and that's why you don't go to anyone and tell people what's going on because yeah. a little tidbit like that gets out and you're, you're, oh, he's you're the one, guy who comes yeah, like he's one and pump done. chump. Yeah, yeah, for life. Never happened to me, right, Annie? Never. Thanks. So now he coaches up in uh, Ona, Iona up in uh, New Rochelle. Go Gales. I love Iona. I've been up there multiple times. Um, and so, again, very, very unfortunate. I'm glad that this girl got thrown in prison for a little while. I believe she's out. She tried to get $10 million off him. But very unfortunate that Rick Pitino doesn't last longer in bed. Uh, a couple of people had uh, asked me to talk about a, a guy named Bill. I didn't ask if I could use his name because his name was just Bill. His avatar was like Tony Siragusa. So you could tell I'd really like Bill. And another guy named Matt Murr. There was some Graham James guy. He was a uh, he was a junior a hockey coach who molested like Theo Fleury, a couple like real big name guys. I think I'm going to try and have like do like one of those social things where I have Rear Admiral talk about yeah. it. Yeah. I think that would be kind of better. I, I yeah. think he would know about it for sure. I think, yeah, I think he knows all that. I think they've talked about it on Chicklets. So, I'd, I, you know, and Rear Admiral is – pretty easy to talk to yeah so i think if i do something with him john it'd make a little bit more sense fountain of knowledge yeah yeah, yeah. the uh devon shore stuff too most recently in that, what is that in that sport that's kind of what i was thinking of uh, when this happened chicago blackhawks i think he oh. was molested by trainer yeah never mind yeah uh, i was thinking i've been i was thinking of the boston bruins guy yeah, who was like bullying as we were yeah, yeah. no i think yeah, i think yeah. that all counts yeah, yeah, yeah. i think yeah. trainers i think all that stuff perhaps it's the same guy because yeah. graham james i think there's also sheldon kennedy was one of these guys that he, he molested. Like, Theo Fleury is the one that, that rings a bell to me, but I don't know much about hockey, so there I am. There was an older guy whose name was Jean Begin. Um, he was a Canadian ice hockey coach uh, back, I guess, in the late 80s. And he was a married father of three and a convicted sex offender. He had sexual contact. He was convicted on seven counts of it with boys in 1989. He only served six months in prison, but he committed suicide right after his release. His burnt corpse was found by police in a car that had a makeshift pipe that redirected the carbon monoxide, and that whole thing had burst into flames. So apparently, you know, Canadian ice hockey is not safe. By the way, I'm so, Kyle yeah. Beach, not Devin Shore. I said a random Oh, really? Okay. Yeah, just to correct. Sorry. Right, right. Okay, <laughs> good. Right. Um, I'm going to do the Penn State follow-up right now if you guys are okay with that. Yep. Uh, we're almost done, so we're going to be getting out of here in a couple of seconds. But Elijah had sent this in. He's like, if you're really interested in diving down a rabbit hole of conspiracies with Paterno and Sandusky, you have to look into Ray Gricker and his connection to the Sandusky case. It's mind-blowing to think about the depth that it goes. All righty. So I scratched the surface on this guy, Ray Gricker. He was a prosecutor in Center County, Pennsylvania, who went missing his presumed dead. Okay? The connection here is that when Sandusky was arrested and charged with sexually abusing boys, it was Gricker who decided not to charge Sandusky when the first victim came forward in 1998. Gricker cited lack of evidence. So the theory was this guy who's missing, like his car was left derelict and stuff, had killed himself out of guilt. But he was a prosecutor. Like, he was a ton of high-profile drug cases. He had a history of suicide in his family, so if he did kill himself, you know what I mean? Like, there was a history there. And they never found the body. He may have just wanted to start a new life. You know what I mean? He was an enemy of mob-like gangs in central Pennsylvania who were upset at his drug and corruption prosecutions. So a forensic pathologist, I'm looking into this, named Cyril Wecht, 
said he considered writing a book about Gricker, his ties to the Sandusky case, and whether that is what led to his suicide, but Wecht said that he abandoned the book idea when it became clear there was not enough strong evidence. Here's a quote from this forensic pathologist. I don't think it's a great stretch. He was one of those guys with a very strong, a strong sense of justice and professional discipline, right? So he's saying it's not a, a long stretch to think that the guy might have killed himself before it. But I speak as a forensic pathologist who's done so many suicides over the year. And what can bring someone to that point? It's pure conjecture, not based on any factual knowledge. And I don't understand how they never recovered the body. I'm going to leave this theory alone. That's what I'm going to do. So if you guys want to go down the rabbit hole to further condemn Sandusky and, you know, have somehow have that lead into Paterno knowing, you certainly can. But Ray Gricker is the place where you may want to start. May want to start. But it just seems way too fucking tangential for me. It's interesting. Yeah, yeah I think so. It, it, I mean, people are sending it in. You know what I mean? Yeah. So I'm going to fucking read it. I feel it. like he wouldn't kill himself out of guilt because it's part of the job. You know, yeah. he's dealt with that. Yeah. But like, maybe, yeah, maybe one of these these mob gangs yeah. killed him. Some other guy named Sean said, I was 100% supporting Paterno until a 1976 court document was found referencing a mother's son who approached old Joe about Sandusky's acts against their boy. It was found by the insurance company of Penn State during their independent investigation due to all the payouts. It was infuriating. And he heard about it first on Jay Moore's show. I like Jay Moore. I think I've seen him live, right? Jay Moore, the comedian? We've seen him live. We've seen him live. We've met him. Yeah, yeah. Nice guy. (laughs) This one was easy to look up. An insurance company called Pennsylvania Manufacturers Association Insurance had claimed that in 1976, a child allegedly reported to PSU's coach, head head coach Joseph Paterno, that he, the child, was sexually molested by Sandusky. So that is what this insurance company had found. Or they say they found. Is that the same kid that approached the prosecutor? I don't know. According to the order, the insurance company further claims that in 1987 and 1998, 1987 and 88, other assistant coaches witnessed inappropriate or sexual conduct between Sandusky and children, and that in 1988, a similar allegation was referred to Penn State's athletic director. There's so many fucking names, I can't keep up with it. So it's out there. But to give equal time to the other side, the pro paterno side, Here's what a spokesman for the Paterno family had in response. Because of a single sentence in a court record of an insurance case, Joe Paterno's reputation has once again been smeared with unsubstantiated 40-year-old allegations. Over the past four and a half years, numerous allegations that were taken as fact when they were initially communicated have been proven false. It is in this context that the latest claims should be viewed. That's probably what a family member should say. Don't believe everything that you read is basically what well, they're saying. Thing, the two boys, the two brothers with the coach from that we were talking about earlier, right? Yeah, 100%. And again, we'll never know unless fucking Sandusky has some tapes of him talking to Joe about it. Like, we'll never know about this. Sandusky's but still in know. Supermax. And then a gentleman named Dancing Rick <laughs> sent I'm in nervous. a podcast. He said, listen to this podcast with the benefit of hindsight. He's like, it will clear Paterno. I think he means it might even clear like Sandusky of a lot of this stuff. Is that Um, the DM we got? Yeah. I didn't think he was saying that. There is no way I could get through this fucking podcast. This thing is three to four hour type things. There's more than 20 episodes. It's called With the Benefit of Hindsight. But I tried to sample it. Listen, I'm trying. I tried to sample. The podcast is successful in pointing out some serious flaws in the reporting of the scandal. Podcast is successful in doing that. And that's part of what the paternal family was saying. Don't believe everything you read, and maybe the reporting has been bad. But I'm not sure it's going to convince anyone that Sandusky is innocent of the wrongdoing or that Paterno didn't know. And the host loves to yell. You think I it, yell when like I talk a, about Woody Allen? I'm sorry, but that sounds like an Alec Jones type. Alex Jones type thing. I would tell you right now, equal time. Give it a listen. I don't have any money in with the benefit of hindsight. They have multiple episodes after this. It seemed like the uh, it had started with the Paterno stuff, and they did. I think it says like episode twenty, but like some of the episodes, like episode nine, has like three episodes. Episode nine, part one, part two. There's like twenty three episodes. They're all average around three hours a piece. No fucking way I get through that. Episode 15 is just over three hours, and it's kind of a recap. So if you want to listen to one just to get a feel for it, and this is what I'm saying for Dancing Rick's thing, because Dancing Rick is a, you know, supports 
Paterno on this, which many people do, this might change your mind. As opposed to listening to this asshole, me and Vibs, these two assholes, maybe the assholes who do with the benefit of hindsight, with all due respect, will change your mind to the opposite. Why is every episode called The Death of Journalism? Yes. Episode yeah. blank. Yeah, I, I think I, that's how he started. Uh, he uh, it's, a, it's a man and a young lady who sort of like reins him in. Um, so he started with this very in-depth, you know, look into this case. And, you know, from his view from 30,000 feet and after all the smoke had cleared, actually does show a refreshing take on it than everyone else who's just trying to come up with stuff as it was happening. Yeah. So yeah. I'm, I'm not I'm not shitting on this at all. I, it's just too, I couldn't get through 70 hours of this. Dancing Rick will have to, he'll, he'll I think he'll I think, allow me that. I think. Right. I want to check the sources. Dancing yeah. Rick, I, I don't trust you. Oh. As a man named Dancing Rick? No, no, no. I trusted Sean. Or Dancing Kevin. Remember Dancing Kevin? <laughs> I trusted Sean and all the other people. But nah, I don't know. You. Dancing Travis. Rick. You like Travis? I like yeah. Travis. Bill I, with the Tony Siragusa thing? Da- you like Bill? I, the goose, he's great, but <laughs> Dancing Rick, yeah. I don't know. Yeah. But no, I, uh, I, I this might be something I listen to. We're getting to the end. At the very end, I'm going to I'm gonna end with PFT, okay? I will close with PFT because he just told this story again, and I like it. This isn't necessarily a scumbag coach, but it's a guy who made a bad decision. PFT loves to tell this story. Maybe I'll have him do it for social or something, but it's about Dale Christensen. He was a high school football coach from Libertyville, Illinois. You'll love this. Uh, he may not be a scumbag, terrible coach, but he did have a lapse in judgment. He resigned in November 1993 after 25 years at Libertyville High School. Right? Mm-hmm. He was either a, a head coach or an assistant coach. That's 25 years of high school is a long time. Ton, right? ton. Yeah, yeah. I mean, that's... It's an anniversary. What is it? Yeah. 25th How long anniversary? has Troy been at... Yeah. It's, uh, 25th anniversary is Diamond? No. Is it? Oh, shit. No, it's not. <laughs> Fuck. That's le- that's next year for us. I got to buy a fucking Diamond. Nice. <laughs> no, I think it's uh, I think Silver. It's, yeah. It's, yeah, it's, it's Zales. <laughs> yeah. It's yeah. Every kiss begins with K. Sterling wow, Silver. you just yeah. saw a reaction out oh, of me. <laughs> I will spit out my fruit So roll Dale up. Christensen, he was 25 Congrats. years, which means nothing, at Libertyville High School. Uh, <laughs> he resigned because he staged his own shooting as a motivational ploy before a playoff game. <laughs> a few hours before the Class 6A semifinal playoff with Loyola Academy, Christian feigned an altercation with two students. They were the only two people who knew. And he gave one of them a starter pistol. It must have been fun to do, though. So the student fires the <laughs> yes. starter pistol, which allegedly misses the other student and shoots fucking Dale in the chest. And he has a blood or ketchup packet, and he does that and falls to the fucking ground. <laughs> and he does this to juice up his team, but the team absolutely freaks out. A lot of them run from the locker room and call the cops. Christian pretended to be shot, fell to the ground, and spilling fake blood. He said he was trying to teach a message of love of family, friends, and teammates, but several terrifying students ran out. Even the coach's son, who was a linebacker, his name was Reed Christensen, was fooled by the use of blank cartridges. Witnesses say that as his father lay on the floor, Christensen cried out, My dad has been shot. That's not good, man. No, that's not good. Yeah. So he resigned after that. And here's the bad thing. Libertyville lost to Loyola 27-14. Later in the year, Superintendent Donald Gossett said he would recommend the school board fire Christensen from his coaching post. uh, Christensen, who was supported by many parents, resigned before a disciplinary hearing was conducted. I, I, you know, it's, it's, it's. That's that's something. He's got to be fired. I agree with that, and I think it's. Oh, I, I love this. But, but yeah. I, I I see yeah. why they did it. But I, I mean, he's awesome. This guy. Awesome. <laughs> we school football is wild. Must have been yes. fun yeah. to do. We all saw until Brett, that moment. Sorry, we all saw Brett Favre go out there and win a yeah. Monday Night Football game when his dad passed away. Yeah. This is kind of the same vibes. Like if the if I'm dead, they're gonna all rally together. <laughs> exact opposite happened. He didn't think it through. No, I mean, 25 no, years at the same not. school, you gotta come up with some shit. I would love to know the. Co- I would love to be a fly on the wall during that conversation where somebody presents the idea and the other person's like, "Ooh, yeah, let's do it." I think it was just him in his own in his own yeah. head that morning like in the shower, he's like, "I'm going to stage my own death." Yeah. Oh, <laughs> That'll get him going. Be great. Yeah. Uh, so that's it. Twisted history of uh Scumbag Coaches Part 2. We'll be back to you guys with pilots. 